On the phone, we have a former great with the Dallas Cowboys. He was absolutely phenomenal in the late 60s, early 70s. Linebacker Leroy Jordan. How are you doing today, Mr. Jordan? Hello there. Good to see you. Good to talk to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> David, you also left out. He, he played a little college football at Alabama. That's not important for. Well, that's not important unless you're from the <laughs> south. I don't know about yeah. that. Well, you you go back and you know fix it any way you want to. <laughs> okay. How did you end up going to Alabama? Was it that you were born there, and that was basically if you're born in Alabama, you got to go to Alabama. Well, not really, but uh, back in uh, the 50s and 60s, uh, you know, you didn't travel like we do now, you know, so uh, you didn't go very far to, you know, uh, to, to college. So did Bear Bryant personally recruit you? Well, uh, his assistant coaches, uh, Gene Stallings and uh, Bobby Drake Keith, uh, were the main ones that recruited me, but, uh, uh, certainly, uh, he was a, the convincing factor when you went in to meet with him. Uh, it, it was kind of like, uh, here was a 18 year old, uh, walking into, uh, God's house, you know, and, uh, <laughs> yeah, lady, it was just a, a special deal when, a, when I got to meet with him at the university and, it didn't take me long to make up my mind when, once he extended me the invitation to come play for him. I, I said yes pretty quick. Is it true that Auburn offered? Yeah. Is it true that Auburn offered you a scholarship and then took it back, the offer? Well, it, it was, yeah, that's kind of true. Uh, they offered me one my junior year, and but uh, I got married my senior year in high school, and uh, they had had some problems with married students, uh, uh, you know, before, and so that was kind of went against their policy, so they withdrew it. You think it would be easier having married students because there would be less partying with those guys? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it was a really a special treat, you know, uh, Coach uh, Shil Jordan, uh, you know, uh, he pronounced it Jordan. I pronounced mine Jordan. So uh, it's probably probably about the same clan back there somewhere. But uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, but it was it was a special uh, you know deal for a guy from that small school to to get to go to the University of Alabama because we were you know whatever the smallest school you can have we had about. Uh, you know, about 300 students, one through 12 grades, you know, so that's, that's the size of the school that uh, I went to. I see you played fullback in high school. How did you end up playing uh, center and linebacker in college? Well, I, I was a running back, tailback, fullback in uh, high school and a uh, linebacker. And uh, at the University of Alabama, Coach uh, Bryant had his uh, – guys uh, that played fullback and linebacker and then he had the other linebacker was a center and linebacker so they you know opted to move me to center didn't think i was quite fleet-footed enough to to, to be a, a running back well you had to be fairly quick to, to play linebacker because you're you're the guy who's supposed to tackle those fleet-footed running backs right Oh, yeah, I got most of them, you know. That's the one thing about it. I, I was quick enough to get most of them. But, uh, you know, back then, uh, you know, I, hey, I was about 200-pounder, and that's uh, most of the offense, offensive, defensive linemen, linebackers were, were about that size, you know. We'd have a 220-pounder a every once in a while, you know. You had a fairly successful college career, played on some – unbeaten teams what what was that experience like playing for bear bryant and being so successful well it, it was really special uh you know coach bryant uh i was the second class he uh recruited uh and he told us after we'd been there for uh 
six weeks in summer training and getting ready for the season that, uh, you know, us freshmen were not going to play in the games. Back then, freshmen could not play on the varsity. So he told us, if you guys keep working hard and with the class that he had recruited first there, that we'll win a national championship before y'all get out of here. And uh, lo and behold, uh, two years later, we did that, you know. Now, your first year is, as a sophomore in 60, you guys went eight, one, and two. You go to the Blue Bonnet Bowl. You tie Texas, and you're named the most valuable player in, in, in that bowl game. Yeah, what, we had what, what, what's good that defense like for a sophomore? That, uh, that game, and uh, I made quite a few turns. And I think I made an interception, too, but I'm not. Pardon? Sorry, but you were breaking up for a second. Okay. No. Per- so, when you did you enjoy playing center more or linebacker in college? I'm sorry. Say that again. I, I, no problem. I, I, did you enjoy Did you enjoy playing center or linebacker more in college? Oh, I, I was always a linebacker. Uh, that was uh, my thrill, and uh, uh, you know that's what I was best at. Uh, uh, the, when it, when I got to come out of the game, it was always on offense. Uh, that's where, when they rested me, uh, I came out on offense and someone else, else, uh, played offensive center when I got a break. Was Joe Namath was there when you were in college. Did you realize that he was going to be what he became? Yes. Um, uh, it was very evident, uh, his freshman year there, he was, uh, a special athlete, you know, he was just as good in baseball and basketball as he was in football. But, uh, but you, you, you could tell he was an unbelievable athlete. And, uh, uh, you know, we, his sophomore year, my senior year, we lost one game by one point or we'd have back to back, uh, national championship. So, uh, he, he was everything that coach Bryant thought he would be when he went up and recruited him. And, uh, uh, the Philadelphia area. When the 1963 NFL draft came around, were you anticipating going in the first round, which is where you went? Yeah, Coach uh, Coach Bryant, uh, you know, uh, talked to several of the uh, pro teams that were inquiring about me, and uh, he had a good rapport with uh, the Cowboy coaches, with Coach Landry and Gil Brandt, the uh, recruiting coordinator and uh uh yeah they they were going to take uh you know they thought they would take me in the first round and uh i guess you know i went number six overall that year so was there any consideration for you joining the rival rival league at that time yeah yeah i thought about it then uh but i was drafted by uh back then it was boston patriots and uh I didn't see myself in South Alabama going to Boston and faring too good in the cold weather up there. So, uh, and you know, in the the lure of the uh, NFL, uh, you know, was a, a part of it too. And being able to come to Dallas in a uh, situation where they were building a team, and uh, that I could be a part of that. Uh, the the foundation that they were going you know build that team. Yeah, the Cowboys. You you weren't quite on the ground floor, but you're about as, as close as you could get to it. They a, <laughs> yeah, they already had a few. They already had a pretty good stash of them there. You know, with Bob Lilly and Don Meredith and people like that. Uh, we we were close. I guarantee at that time. You were named the team's starting linebacker in your rookie year, which was a first there. Did Tom Landry realize how great of a defensive player you were going to become, and that's why he had so much confidence in you as a rookie? Well, I think so. Uh, I think he had a feel that I was going to be very competitive and uh, that I had had fundamentals, uh, uh, you know, already well ingrained in me uh, at at Alabama and that I, I could, you know, I could run, I could tackle, and I could cover, you know. So 
I, and I felt like he he was uh, pretty quick to let me know that you know I was going to play and uh, and uh, you know lucky enough to play uh, started outside lineman back in my uh, rookie year and then uh, when Coach Tubbs retired the next year I moved to middle linebacker. Was there any resentment among the veteran players of who, who's this kid? Not really. Uh, no, they they were always uh, looking for, hey, how, how can we get this team better? How, how can we improve? And uh, and we were all working for the same goal to have a better football team. And uh, uh, I, I didn't see any resentment uh, whatsoever. When we talked to Bob Lilly and the other great players like Mel Renfro and the Cowboys, Chuck Holly, they all said that you were the leader of that defense. Because I always assumed it would be Bob Lilly because he was Mr. Cowley, but they said no, it was Leroy Jordan. Well, Bob Bob was the leader by example, but you know, being the middle linebacker and calling the defenses and everything, it was you know my responsibility to kind of know what everybody was doing and uh, and know their responsibility and assignments and be able to help them you know play better and know exactly what we were doing on every play. So. Uh, you know, without the leadership of Bob Lilly, by example, and everything else, uh, you know, there there wouldn't have been a doomsday defense. Now, I read somewhere about your signing bonus and your salary and the promise of a new car. And yeah. How you'd pick, and how you picked out a Pontiac Bonneville. And then Phil Brandt want, took you to a Buick dealer, and I assume he wanted you to get a Skylark or something like that. What What happened there? Well, uh, well, uh, I went and looked because they had a relationship with a Buick dealer here in Dallas, and so uh, I went and looked, and that was the first year Rivieras came out, and so I said, "I want that one right there," and he said, "Oh no, 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 we didn't, we didn't agree to that much," and so I had to pay twelve hundred dollars uh, out of my bonus to get the car that I hadn't agreed upon signing for back there when I, when I agreed to sign, you know, so, uh, in a little more to that story, uh, uh, Gil Brandt, uh, I had to fly back to, uh, finish up, uh, college exams and couldn't drive the car back cause I needed to be there the next day. So Gil said, well, I'm coming over next week. I'll just drive it over for you. And, uh, in, on a Friday night, uh, he was going to be in there uh, the next morning on Saturday, and he called me from Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and said, "I've I've had an accident." And I said, "You know what what happened?" You know, he said, "I hit a cow on the interstate uh, on in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and so I wrecked your car." <laughs> and you know, like things were tight back then. Uh, the, the uh, the owners and general managers and people didn't give away much money. So he said, if you've got insurance on your other car that will pay for this car I wrecked, and I said, oh. Gil, you telling me that I'm going to have a new wrecked car and you want me <laughs> and my insurance company to pay for getting it fixed? <laughs> oh, well, yeah, if you got it, you know, I said, no, I don't have it. I, I've already given that to my sister. So, <laughs> Uh, so that was, that was pretty about the way it worked with the Cowboys back then. So that, that, that sort of gave you an insight on how tight <laughs> money was going to be, didn't it? Yeah, that exactly right. You know, uh, I got the, I got the whopping five thousand dollar bonus and you know, uh, uh, cash bonus and uh, you know and uh, and you know a monstrous salary back then. You know. Yeah, yeah, so, seventeen thousand five hundred, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah, and I got a, uh, I had a three-year contract that I signed, so I got a thousand-dollar raise every year. So that was, that was a big deal. I was going to say you were just rolling in it. Yeah. It is. <laughs> was there a lot of pressure on you to run that flex defense because that's what Landry was known for? No, I didn't sense a, a, a real pressure. Uh, you know, I, I understood it. I, I, I studied and studied and I studied film uh, every night. I told film uh, to watch uh, uh, our opposing teams and uh, watch 
either learning more about our defense that uh, where Coach Landry would go through things that we needed to do better and and so forth. And so I I, I was uh, I didn't feel any pressure on me. I thought he uh, let me take the leadership and 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 go with it. You know. Did, did you guys go up against Meredith in practice? Oh yeah, we had a lot of fun working against him in practice, you know. Uh, uh, think about it, Don Meredith made it fun no matter what he was doing. If he was working out in two days, he made it fun just like any other time. So uh, he, he was just a, a great teammate, and uh, he just kept everybody certainly relaxed and excited about what he was going to say next or sing next. You know, he, he might break out in the song in the huddle, you know, heck, everybody just couldn't wait to see what he was going to do next. And you had a he big just, change when Roger Staubach took over. He was like the oh, polar opposite. That, <laughs> that was a, quite a difference, you know, that was quite a difference, but, uh, each one of them had their, uh, had their, uh, you know the, the leadership part, and uh, and certainly was a little di- a different style for sure, dis- different personality for sure. So, yeah, I mean, Meredith seemed like the, the polar opposite of of what Tom Landry was, at least on the sidelines, whereas Stalbach well, looked like an extension of Landry. Well, Tom, uh, Tom and Meredith uh, were uh, extreme different uh, they they were so different uh, it was unbelievable and just uh but they work well together and uh, you know uh, tom just uh didn't know what to think of don's that side and entertaining side so I mean, you were used to it with joan amos or he wasn't that flamboyant in college well he wasn't that flamboyant no he was a pretty quiet guy in college and uh, but uh you you could tell by the way uh, he, he played and the big plays he was making that you know he was he was going to be a, a a great you know quarterback and and he certainly showed that uh, you know like uh, his more years. Who who was the toughest running back for you to bring down? Probably Larry Zonka because he was uh, bigger than me by about 40, 50 pounds, I guess, and uh, just a big dude. And not only hard to bring down, but uh, running into that big body as many times as you did in the game, uh, the the next few days were extremely painful. So you can get over uh, a game with uh, the Dolphins, the uh, you know, in a in a day, it took you three or four days to get over a game with them. So. Your line making court with you, Chuck Holly, and Dave Edwards. I think you're basically underrated because everybody always talks about the Bears linebackers, the Ravens linebackers, the Giants linebackers. But it seems like you guys are forgotten. But you, I think you were the key to that defense. Well, we had some real talent. You know, Chuck Holly had big play uh, making ability, and and Dave Edwards was. Uh, the most steady player you would ever see in a game. Uh, I mean, he just did his job outstanding every play and uh, uh, was not quite as uh, spectacular as Chuck, but he didn't make as many mistakes as Chuck did either because Chuck would, he would go where the ball was. He didn't necessarily cover his man uh, a lot of times. So, but uh, we had, to, we had a trio that was, outstanding linebackers and we uh you know we fit in well with our defensive scheme and you know everybody had a role and uh, uh just just uh, handled it extremely well now everybody associates the cowboys with playing on saving day but it was the lions playing the packers what was it like when you guys started playing on thanksgiving you say what aren't we supposed to be playing on sunday not thursday Able to take Thanksgiving Day with your family and everything, you know that was always a holiday for uh, for us guys and so forth. And uh, we'd always get off practice a little early and go home and have Thanksgiving with our families and so forth. And uh, 
but uh, it became a big thing, you know, with uh, us on on Thanksgiving Day, and it became a big game for us. What was Tom Landry like as a coach? Oh, he was just a a great guy. He he was very detail oriented, and you know, he he rehearsed with us and went over the the, the particulars of the defense on you know regular basis I wanted to make sure everybody was in tune with what we had to do as individuals to make the overall concept of this defense work and uh uh he he was a great teacher uh you know he he was not very emotional you know he didn't get yelling screaming you know uh that kind of uh uh generation he didn't generate that kind of enthusiasm but uh he certainly was a, a great teacher and a, and, a, and a great coach now it hasn't been quite 50 years but have you thought out from the ice bowl game against the green bay packers no every time it gets under 40 degrees my hands start to hurt again so uh, <laughs> yeah I, from the frostbite i had you know 50 years ago so uh uh, well, I think plane, how brutal were the playing conditions? It, it looked, you know, like a different sport almost. It was awful. It, it was, uh, you know, the last quarter was like ice skating, and uh, they had on tennis shoes, and we had on our regular cleated shoes. Uh, we didn't have any spare shoes. We never in, anticipated being on a frozen field up there, and. Uh, at halftime, I think they went tennis shoes, and we ended up sliding down on that last drive. I guess most of our guys were in position to make the, the plays, but slipped down. And, uh, you know, it just was horrible conditions. And I guess it's the most recognizable game, I guess, in the history of football because of those conditions. Because I know Landry was rivals with um... – the Packer coach because they were both him and Lombardi were both assistants with the Giants back in the late fifties. Yeah, Vince was the offensive coach and uh, Tom was the defensive coach, and then they went on to be head coaches. And he, both of them had their way, you know. Uh, uh, Tom was a lot more in, creative and inventive, and uh, but uh, Vince knew how to win games and win championships too. I heard that Tom never swore. All the former players said that. Said they never what? Tom Landry never swore. He was so mild mannered. No, he 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 didn't. He didn't. He didn't yell or scream or well, he would get raise his voice a little bit, and that's all it took, you know, for us to get back in gear and get to work, you know. So. Uh, now, '63 was your rookie year. It was also the year that. President Kennedy was assassinated in, in Dallas. How difficult was it playing that following Sunday in Cleveland? Well, it, it was very difficult. I, I was hurt a, a week or so before, so I didn't go. I didn't go with the team on that game. But uh, they they said it was extremely difficult, and uh, you know we kept thinking that you know they would be called off and and postponed for a week at least and uh, but that didn't happen and uh you know later on years later uh, you know playing in washington philadelphia and other cities uh, they were not nice to us at all uh, you would think that the dallas cowboys had killed them, so not not a good situation when did you become known as america's team well i i think uh <clears throat> With the excitement, I think that Don Meredith and Bob Hayes and uh, uh, and the guys uh, uh, brought to the game and all the motions and the creativity that uh, Tom Landry brought to the game because there was all the there was not much of that before Tom Landry and started moving people around everywhere and having three or four receivers in it and one back and you know lots of things that were real creative and ways to utilize uh, guys uh, to take advantage of an opposition defense. And uh, he was just, uh, I think in the early 70s, it uh, kind of caught on. And 
we, we developed so many fans and on the West Coast. We would go out there to training camp every year and stay out there for four to five weeks and play uh, the Rams or San Francisco and San Diego and, you know, swap back and forth. Uh, we'd play them a lot of times uh, twice a year on the, on the West Coast. And uh, we developed a lot of fans around the country. And uh, uh, everywhere we would go, there would just be a, a good number of Cowboy fans. And uh, so we uh, – I don't know who brought it up. I guess Tex did. I guess it was might have, might have been his marketing tool that, uh, to call it America's team. So the cheerleaders didn't. The cheerleaders weren't what people were coming out to see. Yes, it caught on and just uh, became became a big thing. And uh, you know that. Uh, uh, and and you know we we won some championships and not lately, but uh, you know we've been lucky as far as we could to to do that and uh uh so i hope they'll uh get it in gear uh, again sometimes down the road you know I, I keep wishing and hoping but uh you know we've had about 10 or 15 years of dry spell i thought they came out to see the cheerleaders not the team yeah <laughs> yeah they they come to see the cheerleaders in the stadium <laughs> don't don't come see the cowboys anymore now, you, you mentioned uh, Chuck Schramm, with whom you did not have the warmest of relationships. Four yeah. days before the, the 1973 season opener in Chicago, you walked out of practice. I would assume it, it took a lot for you to have to do something like that. What what caused all that? Well, it, uh, I had told Mr. Schramm the year before that I wanted to get my contract renewed and uh, and over with. Uh, uh, during the off season, and we didn't get it done. I, I think we met one time, and uh, uh, I couldn't. He was always somewhere else, and I couldn't get him to meet with me. He liked to kind of bring you to training camp, and you know, back then you went to training camp, you got hurt, you didn't have a contract, so you didn't you you, you didn't get anything. You, you, they could cut you right then and not pay you anything. So, uh, so you know. It, after this uh, preseason, we got back here, and regular season was going to start the next week, and they cut the last linebacker that was had any experience in backing me up. So, uh, Coach Andrew and assumed I was going to be healthy, and if they needed somebody to fill in, Dee Dee Lewis could do it, but he was playing outside linebacker most of the time. So, uh I just decided I wasn't going to practice until I got a contract and felt like I had a little advantage right then since they didn't have a backup for me. So I just didn't show up for practice on Monday morning, and they started calling me, Gil and Coach Tubbs and Coach Landry, and I just told them, you know, I'm not going to play without a contract. I want to finish my career in Dallas, and I'd like to have a contract. And uh, so – Within four to six hours, Mr. Tram and I agreed upon a contract that, that was acceptable to me. What was it like playing in that Super Bowl when you beat the uh, Dolphins? That was it, it was special for us because we'd gotten so close so many times. And uh, the year before, we'd lost in the last 10 seconds on a field goal and should have won that ball game, because, but we made uh, – uh, too many mistakes on offense and turnovers and so forth like that. So didn't win. Uh, but to finally get there and win the championship when we'd been so close so many times, that was really special and, uh, and a great rewarding time for all this group of guys that had been working so hard. So, I think the only mistake Tom Landry made in his coaching career after talking to Lance Allworth was when – he didn't throw the ball enough to Lance Allworth because your Bob Hayes wanted the ball all the time. Well, I don't know about that. Uh, uh, I, I think he gave Meredith the opportunity to throw it to whomever he thought was open, and um, uh, and maybe he, uh, you know, we could have moved it around a little more. But uh, you know, Lance uh, was a 
a big part of our offense. You know, he was certainly a, a key guy for when they double, co- double covered elsewhere, meaning Bob Hayes. Uh, so we get we had, uh, you know, great combination of uh, receivers and you know tight ends that were really good and. Uh, especially in the running game and blocking, and were good as alternate receivers also. I know when Jerry Jones bought the team, some people were upset. One thing I think it allowed was you to finally enter the Cowboys' ring of honor. What, what was you, you were the first uh, person that entered the ring of honor under Jerry Jones. What was that like? Well, I, I felt really good. Jerry said, uh, you know, told me that the most, question had been asked of him is why is Leroy Jordan not in the ring of honor? And, uh, and some of them explained to him why I wasn't in there. And so Jerry said, he told me, he said, I'm going to make that right. I'm going to have you in the ring of honor this year. And, uh, I said, fantastic. Great. I'd love to be up there on a wall with, uh, coach Landry and Bob Lilly and Roger and, you know, those kind of guys. So, so I I feel real grateful for him doing that because that's more important to me than the uh, the Hall of Fame in the NFL. So uh, the, the, being in the Ring of Honor of the Cowboys is more important to me. You started the Leroy Jordan Lumber Company. Did you supply any of the lumber for the new Texas Stadium? Uh, probably not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> probably no lumber in it. Probably. Uh, <laughs> Uh, probably all concrete like that. So, is there one play that you made that stands out in your career? Well, I, I think uh, probably one of my highlights uh, of my career uh, is a professional. I intercepted three passes in one quarter here in uh, Dallas at the Texas Stadium and return one of them for touchdowns. So I've still kind of got a, you know, a little record there that uh, it's pretty, pretty important, uh, you know, deal for a linebacker to do. And uh, so I felt real bad about uh, for Kenny Anderson because he was the one who was throwing to me. So uh, <laughs> I went over to apologize to him later after the game, but uh, I told him I was, really appreciated him throwing those balls to me. 